The final concept we can talk about in this chapter are something known as contestable markets. Markets that look monopolistic, but actually aren't because the threat of entry is so low. So contestable markets, they can fall under the monopoly category because they can be seen as monopolistic, but in reality, they actually are not. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at contestable markets. Contestable markets. And Contestable markets, as we've said before, these are markets that look monopolistic. Markets are industries or firms. Markets that look like a monopoly, that look monopolistic. But where entry costs are low and the sheer threat of entry keeps prices low. So essentially, they cannot charge monopoly prices. They have to keep prices low. So here are markets that look monopolistic, but the where entry costs are low but where entry costs are low and the threat of entry and the threat of entry keeps prices low keeps prices low so we actually don't have the barriers to entry or the obstacles that prevent new firms from entering into this part into this particular market. So once again, these contestable markets are markets that look monopolistic, but where entry costs are low and the threat of entry keeps prices low. So an example of this is going to be something that you see here on the slide, an airline. Suppose that a smaller airline for some reason, is the only flight that flies from Miami to, say, Arkansas. So Arkansas is a pretty random place. So suppose that Spirit or Frontier are the only airlines that fly from Miami to Arkansas. And by the way, never fly on Spirit or Frontier because they're, they are absolutely terrible. Please don't ever have that experience. So why can't Spirit or Frontier charge monopolistic prices even though they are the only airline that flies from Miami to Arkansas? They are the only one on this particular route. The main reason why they can't charge very high or monopoly prices is because what is going to happen with all the other airlines? When American Airlines, when Delta, when United, they see Frontier or Spirit making a ton of profit by flying this one single route, what are they going to do? They're going to go ahead and say, hey, I want these profits for myself, and they themselves are going to start flying the route as well. So from Miami to Arkansas. So we don't have the barriers to entry that prevent other firms from going down this route or preventing them from serving customers on this route. So therefore, we consider Frontier and Spirit to be a contestable market. They look monopolistic because they are the only ones flying this route, but they, are, they can't charge monopoly prices because, because the other airlines can essentially go in and service the people as well. Other examples of contestable markets, so suppose that you are the only, say, electrician in the little village that you live in, why can't you charge monopoly prices? Once again, because another person can come in and say, hey, I am also an electrician, there's nothing preventing this one person from servicing the same market that you do, so once again, you are the monopoly as of right now, but the sheer threat of entry has to keep your prices low, so contestable markets in a crux. With all of this in mind, this does wrap up chapter number nine, where we talked about the Monopoly. And Monopoly is just not a board game, which causes a lot of grief between your friends. It's also a second type of market structure that we can focus in on, where there is the most amount of market power. I don't think I've ever finished a full game of Monopoly before. It's just so long, and a lot of people rage quit. So under the Monopoly, we've taken a look at the typical uh, profit maximizing points. We've taken a look at the inefficiencies of a Monopoly, and we talked about how a Monopoly can raise their own profits by practicing some type of price discrimination, first degree, second degree, or third degree price discrimination. We talked about natural monopolies and how to regulate them. And then we finally took a look at exactly how we can measure market concentration using the concentration ratios and the herfindel hirschman index. With all of this in mind, we will wrap up the rest of our market structures in chapter number 10 with with monopolistic competition and the oligopoly, probably the weirdest chapter we're going to encounter for this entire semester. So great job. I'll see you guys in that chapter.